Oh, happy haze. <laughs> Hi everyone, Mrs. Hayes here. So in my last video, I was giving some tips and tricks, my one-liners that I always use in my classroom, and those will really set you, set you up for success for the whole school year. If you're using those at the beginning of the year, throughout the year, I promise you're, you're going to start to say them in your sleep. But I also wanted to give some pointers and wanted to kind of show you how I like to roll out my lessons. So when you're actually teaching content in a few weeks, I wanted to give you just some overarching themes that will really, really help you to make sure that you're staying on track. So like before, I am going to model a lesson and once I'm finished modeling that lesson, then I will break it down for you. So like my previous video, I'm going to go into my teacher teacher mode and pretend I'm teaching a lesson. Then I'll break down that lesson for you and give you the specific tricks and tips that I did so that you can implement them in your classroom or at home with your kids. Good morning, kindergartners. Now we are going to start our math lesson with this board here. What do you notice? about my board. I notice there are hearts. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are hearts. What else do you notice? They're kind of all over the place. They're in no specific order. You're right. They're not, they're not in a line. They're not in a circle. They're just kind of all over the place. That's true. What else do you notice? Today, we are going to learn to count objects. We're going to learn to count objects. We're going to learn to count objects. That's right, count objects. And here, what are the objects? Yeah, they're hearts. Now, are you always going to count hearts? No, sometimes they'll be circles, squares, rectangles. Sometimes they'll be dogs. Whatever they may be, you're going to need to count them. So you might say, Mrs. Hayes, how do I count objects? I'm so glad you asked. Now, when you're counting objects, it's important to keep track of which ones you're counting. So my favorite strategy is cross and count. You say it, cross and count. That's right, I love the cross and count strategy. That's my favorite. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to cross and count. Now, before I do, I wanna ask, why would I need to learn to count? Why would I need to learn to count? Especially on paper. Well, you need to count if you're counting groceries at the store. That's true. What's another time you might need to count? Yes, objects for your backpack that you need to bring to school. What else would you need to count? Wow, so many real life times that you're going to have to count things, right? This is a really important skill when you become a grown up, And you are really gonna be using a lot of counting in first grade, in second grade, in third grade. So it's very important that you know how to count in kindergarten. Now, let's get to it. I told you that we're going to learn to count by crossing and counting. You say it, crossing and counting. I call it cross and count. Now, what you'll do is you are going to cross out each object as you count it. So, one would be here, right? But do I go like this? One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight. Oh, there are eight. Say no, Mrs. Hayes. So the reason we're not going to use our finger is because you'll lose track. I don't know which ones I counted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I could just go on forever. But if I use my marker or you use a pencil on your paper, whatever you're using, you can cross it out as you count. Get ready. One, two, three, four, five. Did you see how I crossed them out? There were five 
hearts. There are five hearts. So I would write the number five. And I can tell as the teacher that you crossed each one out and then you wrote the number five. So this tells me you used the cross and count strategy. Now, I've seen other scholars try to do cross and count and they put a big X on top. And let me tell you why that's not a good strategy. Because what I've seen them do, <laughs> they got tricked, is they would say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What was wrong? Can you raise a silent hand to tell me what did you see wrong? That's right, when they were putting an X over top, they actually counted it two times instead of one. So when you're doing cross and count, remember you just cross one for each object. Now we're going to do it together. So on your board, everyone have their board? Everyone have their marker? Show me. I want to see who's ready. They have their board and their marker. Oh, they're ready. They're ready. They're ready. All right. Now, this time, obviously, since you have nothing on your board, you're actually going to count the objects as you draw them. But then we'll make sure we know how many after. Okay? So you're going to do this with me. Watch Mrs. Hayes and you do it too. Okay? The first one, we're going to draw one circle. Go ahead. One circle. Good. Two circles. Good. Good. And three circles. All right. So we already know that this is three. We already know that. But we need to practice our strategy. And we are learning to count objects. And we are learning to count objects by crossing and counting. So I want you to cross and count with me. Get ready. We're going to do it together. Ready. Go. One, two, three. What should we write? Three. That's right. We counted three by crossing and counting. All right. Can you erase your boards? Let me see your boards. Let's see. You crossed and counted. You crossed and counted. Awesome. Who can raise a silent hand and tell me how did we count those circles? That's right, we crossed and counted. And why is crossing and counting better than using our finger? Exactly, you can lose track when you're using your finger. And it tells the teacher that you're using the correct strategy. Now, last but not least, who can raise a silent hand and tell me why do we need to know how to count? Go. Amazing example. Why do we need to learn how to count? Give me another one. Definitely. Fantastic. All right. Last but not least, before you go off and practice by yourself, I want you to do one more and show me that you can do it by yourself. Are you ready? Fantastic. Before we do it, tell me one last time the strategy you're going to use is cross and count. That's right. You say it and count. You say it and count. All right, I think you're ready. We're going to draw them together and then you will cross and count by yourself. I call that independent. You say it, independent. Good. All right, this time let's do one circle in each corner. One up here, 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 and here. Show me your boards. When I say, but not yet, you're going to cross and count, then write the number. Are you ready? Go. I see Xavier crossing and counting. I see Samantha crossing and counting. I see Michael writing his number. When you have it ready, I want you to have your board just like this and hiding it from everyone else. I know you're ready because you're hiding your board. 
I know you're ready. You're hiding your board. Almost everyone. All right. Boards up. Amazing. Everyone should have crossed one, two, three, four, and written the number four. I'm looking to see if you have the number four. Give yourself a pat on the back. Well done, my loves. All right, so today you learned how to count objects. You learned how to, you learned how to. So I want you to say it with me and take your thumbs like this and say, I can count objects by crossing and counting, by crossing and counting. One last time, I can count objects by crossing and counting. That's right. And you learn to do that because there are so many different times you're going to need to count things in your life forever and ever and ever. So at this time, it's all yours. It's time for you to do it by yourself. Here we go. We're going to transition back to our seat. So one thing I love to do at the beginning of a lesson is to hook them with a question and I just showed the board and I said, what do you notice, right? So then they're already engaged. They already want to know what they're going to learn. They see, they see hearts. The hearts are not in a line. The hearts are not in a circle, right? So you're, you're having them start the conversation instead of saying, hi, I'm your teacher. This is what you're learning today. You want them to investigate what they're going to learn today before you jump in and tell them. I actually just learned the what do you notice or what questions do you have when you look at this. These open-ended questions at the beginning of a lesson is super helpful. I just learned it at a conference the other day and you can use it for any lesson, any subject. Think about if you're just starting a new book. Just show them the front cover. What do you notice? What do you think this book is going to be about, right? Just ask open-ended questions about whatever you're doing that day and really get them invested and engaged before you tell them what they're going to learn. Now, what you'll notice is at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end, I'm telling them what they learned. I'm telling them how to learn it and I'm telling them why they're learning it. So what, how, why, put that down. What, how, and why. And I think the why is the most important because I find that there are so many lessons that I have to really stretch my imagination to make it relevant for them because a lot of the time you're like, why would they need this in real life? Why am I actually teaching this to you? And so if you make it relevant to them and they understand that this is really important and they really do actually need to learn it, they're going to be way more invested and engaged in the lesson. And a way to do that and make it really engaging, like over the top engaging, is at the beginning of the year to start off your year learning about their interests. So I am actually going to create an all about me slide. I will post it when I create it in my link below. And I really want to know what they love to do in their free time. I love to know what they like to do with their families. I love the, to know their favorite foods, right? And after you have all these interests, then you can use that in your lessons and really engage them, right? You'll say, I really know that this scholar is going to be engaged if I tell him today we're not just counting circles, we're counting Lamborghinis because he loves cars. Does that make sense? So if you really, really know the kid's interests, you can make any lesson extremely engaging because you're using their interests and really focusing on them as learners instead of focusing on the objective. So once you've stated the what, the how, and the why, then you can move on to the lesson, the meat of the lesson. And I always do, I do, we do, you do. Say that again. I do, 
so you watched me model it and they just watched they just watched me do it then we do together so I went step by step through the directions with them then when they felt like they got it I only did one example as a we do I usually do two or three so they really feel confident and then they'll do the you do right so the students are doing it by themselves and that's where you'll really have them do lots of independent practice I like to do at least a couple independent whole group so I can kind of scan and you saw me I do boards up so I can scan to see who's getting it right away and who is still isn't then when they go into the independent practice I'm circulating and making sure I'm checking on those ones that didn't quite get it on their whiteboards so I hope that's helpful I do we do you do and really focus on the we do and the you do don't spend much time on the I do you're only showing one or two Okay. Do not, I think a lot of teachers spend too much time showing and not allowing the students to do the work themselves. Another thing you'll notice a lot from me is the call and response. So what I mean by that is I would say you're going to use cross and count. You say it, cross and count. You say it, cross and count. And it goes back to what I was talking about earlier in the turn and talk where they say it over and over again and that really solidifies it in their brain. They're really mastering it if they're repeating it multiple times. So you'll hear a lot of um, call and responses in my classroom and you can do it for literally anything. Do you know what I do? I sometimes I will forget what I'm about to say and I will just do a call and response. So in the middle of a math lesson, I'll be like, five times five is, five times five is, and then all of a sudden I will remember what I was teaching about. So sometimes you can use a call and response and it will just bring kids back in. Because again, what I was saying earlier, if you're just standing in front of the classroom and spewing information at them, they're gonna be looking out the window unengaged. But if you are asking them questions and they all need to respond at the same time, they're going to be super, super engaged throughout. And don't overthink it. It can literally be today in math, today in, we're going to learn to cross and count. We're going to learn to, it can be so simple. It doesn't need to be over the top. You don't have to rehearse it. You will just start to get the hang of it and they'll finish your sentences. And finally, I love to have them tell us I can at the end of the lesson. A lot of the times I would start the lesson saying I can, but they'd be like, no, I haven't learned that yet, <laughs> which is a great point. So I have them all state the objective at the end, I can, and then they'll tell what they learned and how they learned it. And that's just a perfect little tie a bow at the end of your lesson so that they walk away knowing exactly what they learned. I hope that was helpful for you. Thanks for watching.